Okay, uh, filling in for Kevin this morning, who is out, who may have COVID. Uh, I think Michael Selvage was also exposed at work, which doesn't mean that he has it, but uh, he's being careful as well. And we know of others. And prayer request, Dan. I'm Reagan. I'm Reagan. I'm Reagan. I'm Reagan. Oh, what? Reagan is in oh. the hospital. She has pneumonia. Reagan is? Reagan is in the hospital, so they're still there with me. They kept her over the hospital. All right. If you didn't hear Di uh, Diana, uh, Reagan, uh, Jeff and Charisse's little girl, uh, she's uh, in the hospital and, uh, with pneumonia. And so. That comes as a surprise to us. I know it comes as a shock to the family. So we will want to pray for that little girl, Bill. Our daughter Susan Giles has covered COVID and is at home. Uh, she's been in the hospital for the last two weeks. Uh, our other daughter, Ashley, is in the hospital with COVID. Uh, our daughter, Ashley, has tested positive for COVID. That's in Oklahoma. And his brother, twin brother, Joel, isn't feeling well and they're rooming together. Uh, kind of have a feeling which way that's going. Uh, Dave, is this about uh, the Hannah, the lady at the arm? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I okay. appreciate that. Uh, Kevin's not here, but he texted me uh, some things that he wanted done, so that's what I've got. Uh, uh, Dave met a lady at the ark and she asked for our prayers. Her daughter Hannah and her unborn granddaughter. And so we will want to remember those needs in our prayer. And then, uh, I forget if it was last, it must have been last Sunday, I mentioned something about a little baby named Eden. Uh, a uh, Bear Valley friend, brother, uh, acquaintance of mine. Uh, the little baby was born way premature. They do amazing things now. So she got to come home from the hospital when she was about three pounds or so. But her little lungs uh, apparently are not fully formed and needing help. She's been in the hospital for about two weeks now on a ventilator. But uh, her eyes are open, and now the parents are waiting to see if the oxygen uh, to the brain, uh, if she's going to come out of that, the same little girl that she went into the coma. So we'll want to pray for that. Pam's sister, Linda, many of you know, uh, Linda went to uh, Israel with us on our 2010 trip. Her husband, Rob, has been uh, diagnosed with dementia. And uh, some of you know better than others uh, what the coming weeks and months and years will bring with that. So we'll want to pray for her. Uh, anybody else have something? Kevin had his Bible class material and everything all laid on the lectern, and I picked it up with my shirt sleeves and moved it. So that's, we're being careful this morning. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our dear Father, we are so grateful that we have this avenue, that we have this access to thy throne of grace, and our every need, our every hurt, our every want, our every concern, we may openly and freely share with Thee, and we know that our prayers are being heard. This morning we want to pray for those in our Pikes Peak family that we know are dealing with COVID issues, Kevin and perhaps Kelly Ballard, uh, John Rabb and Michael Selvage and no doubt some others. We also want to remember 
the lady who asked for prayers, her daughter Hannah and her unborn granddaughter. And dear father, that family situation and those concerns we bring before thee. And we also pray for the little baby Eden and her family, her mom and dad, as they are concerned with her health as she remains in intensive care. Pam's sister Linda, her husband Rob, and dear father, we ask thy blessings upon that family, upon Reagan, who is in the hospital with pneumonia, Reagan Overstreet. And dear Father, our prayer is that the treatment, the medicine, the antibiotics, the vapors, and the other things that they do for her might soon quickly break up that congestion and there be no lasting ill effects from that. For Susan John, Bill and Janelle's daughter who is suffering from COVID issues and their grandsons, Paul, and most likely Joel, as they room together in college and as they go through this protocol and sickness. Dear Father, we ask that thy hand will be upon them and they might be strengthened and recovered soon. And there are plenty of other names. And as we go together in prayer, some at this very moment are calling those names in their mind and in their heart, and we add them to this prayer. Dear Father, bless and keep us all. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last minute, what to do, what to do? Well, I've been preaching a while, and uh, I've got files and stuff stuffed everywhere. So I'm not going to tell you a story. I just threw it open and pulled out something and said, hey, for one Sunday morning, let's just go with this. Kevin is finishing up the book of Romans. I think he probably would have finished this morning. And then, Lord willing, his plan is to go into 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And hopefully, Kevin will be back with us next Sunday morning if things go well. But I thought for a one and done, we might talk about something real, real familiar to us and try to tie that in to the times in which we live. You know, Bible study can be profitable, it can be pleasant, it can be encouraging, but until we really begin to connect the dots with my struggle, my need, and what is confronting me, it doesn't really get its full benefit. So we might be thinking, what did ancient Corinth have in common with the world you and I live in today? Let that be percolating here for a few minutes. And then we'll get back to it in a few minutes. Everybody knows, don't we, that Corinth is the problem church in the New Testament. And, you know, there's just some Bible questions that we could ask. Who was the friend of God? Well, God has had a lot of friends. I hope that we include ourselves in that number. But Abraham is called specifically the friend of God. And who was the doubting apostle? Hey, you know, most people would say Thomas. Uh, in some ways, Thomas kind of gets a bum rap from that, but he's the fellow that said, you know, I, I won't believe, I can't believe, unless I see it with my own eyes and feel it with my own hands that he's risen from the grave. Well, just so. Jeremiah, 
the weeping prophet, and we could go down the list, but to the popular mind, Corinth. <clears throat> Corinth is kind of known to us as the problem church of the New Testament. Was it the only church in the New Testament we read about that had problems? <laughs> no. Uh, kind of like I've got problems. They're little bitty tiny problems. You've got problems and they're bigger than Pike's Peak. But uh, sometimes that's kind of the way that we react. So what were some of the problems in the Jerusalem church, the first church? Did they have problems, John? Well, they were in the heart of Judaism. In the heart of Judaism and so there was the persecution. Just every day, my. I think first of all, read about it when they were having trouble taking care of and widows. Acts chapter six. There was a cultural divide in the Jerusalem church, and sometimes even real good people have that blind spot, and so the Greek speaking. Jews who were not born and native to Palestine, who moved to Jerusalem uh, and were not native stock. Josephus tells us they had their own synagogues, they had their own markets, and they shared this kind of foreign background, even though they were Jews. Well, they were kind of out of the mainstream. And the good brothers and sisters in Jerusalem just kind of overlooked them when it came to daily ministration and helping those who were in need, especially the widows. And even more than that, when the Jerusalem church heard that Peter went inside a Gentile's house, what was their reaction? Horror, yeah, quarantine. They called him in and said, what about this? And so that's Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius. Acts chapter 11, Peter having to explain himself, defend himself. And so the Jerusalem church, well, there's a lot of reasons why we look to it as a model because it was first, in fact, the sermon this morning has to do with the Jerusalem church. Uh, we don't turn a blind eye though. They have their issues. And some of these others, Thessalonica, that's where Kevin is going next in this class. Uh, what were the folks in Thessalonica all upset and confused about? Jesus is coming. Same thing a lot of people are upset and confused about today. Jesus is coming, but that didn't really comfort some of them. What about our loved ones who, didn't, who weren't able to hold out? And they died before Jesus came. Are they going to lose some of their reward? Well, to us, you know, it might kind of seem that that's a silly question, but it was real to them. And Paul wrote one letter to answer some of their questions. And then in a matter of just a few weeks or maybe a few months, had to turn right around and write a second letter covering some of the same ground. I'm like that sometimes, aren't you? I mean, it's got to be explained not just once, but at least twice before I get it. And that was a problem in Thessalonica. And Colossae, Ephesus, well, my goodness, we could just take the rest of Kevin's class time this morning. Every church, every congregation is made up of people. And, and you know what they're like. And so... Pike's Peak, I'm here to declare 
It's the best, most nurturing, most spiritually satisfying family I've ever been a part of. But, you know, from time to time, we need to talk about something. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, and it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges and issues. That's just the way people are. The divine plan for the church is perfect, but the people working the plan, we're not perfect. And so, Corinth, well, no matter what we say, it's still going to be remembered as the problem church of the New Testament. That's the answer to the trivia question. But they were not the only one. And now then, why did Corinth have some problems, though, that we don't read about in Colossae? We don't even read about in Rome. And Kevin's been leading us through a study of Rome since before COVID. But that's kind of cheating, isn't it? Because we took out a year for the COVID and didn't have the Bible class here in the auditorium. But we've seen firsthand, up close and personal, Paul having to direct himself to some issues in Rome. Some of the issues in Corinth were not the ones that the Romans struggled with. There's something about Corinth, and I think the more we kind of dwell on that, the more Corinth is like 2022 USA. I'm just now kind of without thinking about it saying 2022. I've Still, seems I have a trouble whenever the calendar changes from one year to the next. Ancient Corinth, a whole lot like the world you and I live in today. Corinth was a cosmopolitan crossroads of the ancient world. And Lesson, Vicky, did y'all visit Corinth? Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Don and Connie. Okay. Anybody else? It's on my bucket list. And that bucket list gets deeper and deeper. But uh, Corinth, if you look at a map of ancient Greece, you've got upper Greece, you've got lower Greece, and then you've got that thin connecting where the two are joined. Corinth is on the west side of that. And uh, it was where the ships would come in from the east, Rome. And sometimes they would limber and unload their merchandise. And there was a canal in the ancient world that was dreamed about and took a long time to be built. But there was an overland portage and the ships over on the eastern coast. And so Corinth was on the main highway of not just Greece, but the whole Mediterranean world. And Corinth, so far as I know, Corinth was not home to a world-class philosopher, learned man, scholar. It seems that they all went to Athens, and that's where the business was. But Corinth was worldly, wealthy, wicked. And the brethren there living there uh, they had some temptations that the folks in Bethlehem, Nazareth, Capernaum, uh, they had some temptations in Corinth that other folks didn't face. And so you think about Corinth was rock lights, big city. Uh, you could find anything in Corinth. 
And Corinth had a reputation. In the ancient world, whenever they would stage a play, and the actor would come on stage and he was identified as a Corinthian. Do you know how he was portrayed more often than not? As a drunk. So Corinth had this worldwide reputation so that if you were watching a play, and in our culture today, if you're sitting there watching TV or if you go to a movie, and there's someone in the cast, and he's from Corinth. He's the fella who was the drunk. And that tells us something about Corinth's reputation. And I've never been to Vegas. What I could tell you about New York City was through the eyes of a 15-year-old or from LaGuardia or JFK Airport, and that's not really the city, uh, spent one whole whopping night in Chicago. And you know, some of the great cities of our country and the world, I, all I know mostly is what I've read about. But Corinth was the Vegas of its day, the New York City of its day, it was uh, not so much the elite leading educational set, but it was the roll up your sleeve and make money and spend money and have fun capital of the ancient world. And that's the background that brothers and sisters were converted from. So... Corinth was not only a big city, but it was a big Greek city. And in recent years, seems to me that people have taken umbrage to that description of pagan. And, you know, that's judgy. That's hypocritical. And those people, I mean, maybe they didn't know about it, but they were sincere, they were zealous, they were dedicated. But I think at least in our Bible classes and coming at it from a biblical perspective, there is such a thing as paganism. And how would you describe, define paganism? What do you do, what do you believe that kind of falls under the umbrella heading of paganism or being a pagan day? I think in the case of Corinth, it was people who dealt with it all actually who were accepting, accepting of things like homosexuality and, and uh, relationships with children Okay, you and I would probably feel, file that under the heading of moral issues. And we need to be careful there. Is lying a moral issue? You bet it is. Stealing, cheating, shady business deals. You know, morality is more than abortion, drunkenness, homosexuality, or whatever. Morality is a great big tent. And at some time, all of us camp under it. But, you know, it was Corinth, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, and such were some of you. And the list of things that he enumerates there, kind of graphic and clear cut uh, which church was it that Paul would write saying that even in your own fellowship in your own assembly there's one of your members who's living open <coughs> with his mother-in-law that was Corinth wasn't it no shame and uh just kind of live and let live. 
And so we put all these clues together. And that's Corey. And one thing I would suggest that kind of makes up one component of that pagan classification is the belief in many gods. Well, that's Greece through and through. And I suspect all of us, we've got more than just a passing acquaintance with uh, the Greek gods and the demigods and the great stories of the ancient world and how that it was in Greece where just up the road in Athens, Paul says you've even got an idol, a walter here to the unknown God. Well, Athens wasn't Corinth, but it was today. You know, it's about an hour and 30 minutes straight line travel. If the traffic isn't bad, it's close. And the same kind of people, the same background was true of the folks in Corinth. They were not worshipers of the one true and living God, but they embraced any God and every God. And so in Corinth and in most of the Greek cities, worldliness, immorality, corruption, toleration of just about anything and everything, life was cheap, idolatry. All these things were true in Corinth. And Corinth featured the pomp and pageantry of pagan rites and ritual, feasts and festivals, temples and shrines, the essence of worship and religion that was far removed from the simple faith of Jesus and his disciples. So, Corinth. And then there's something else in Corinth. The Corinthians loved their cliques and their parties and their divisions and their separation from others who spoke the same language, lived in the same neighborhood, worshiped the same gods, but there was just something in the Corinthian DNA that made them especially vulnerable to partyism. And what do you remember from 1st and 2nd Corinthians that just ties in with this? What was in the church at Corinth that smacked of partyism? They were identifying by who it baptized them. Yeah, I am a Paul. I'm in the camp of Apollos. Not me. Give me Peter any old day. And then Paul says, now that I've, transfer, I've transferred these names as a figure. And it's not that Paul and Apollos and Peter were champions parties that were following them but 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Paul talks about Peter can do no wrong in your eyes and he can travel with his wife you don't say a mumbling word and then the way that I choose to conduct my business working not leading about a wife and some other matters, you think somehow that makes me less than the chief of the apostles. So the Corinthians were quick to divide. And they did. And it was to the church at Corinth that Paul asked, is Christ divided? It was to the church at Corinth that Paul says, you know, when you come right down to it, I'm hard pressed to remember exactly who I might have baptized with my own hands. 
Paul had helpers to do that. Timothy, Titus, Silas, Barnabas, others that traveled with him. And Paul says, looking back in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't baptize more of you personally, lest you latch on to me and make something more than it ought to me. And how does this fit? 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, Paul says that we're all workers in the field. And all of us are laborers in the vineyard. And we all have the same master. And he's trying to combat that party spirit in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And if you're looking at the first few verses, Paul says, hello. And then, Folks from the household of Chloe have told me. And what did the family of Chloe tell Paul? We're in a mess. We're at each other's throats. We're divided. In Corinth, when they came together in their assembly, and in that assembly, the Lord's Supper was being observed. They weren't even doing that together. And you know, as an aside, that verse in 1 Corinthians 11, whoever partakes of this in an unworthy manner, well, that means that we ought not Take of the Lord's Supper in a flippant, casual manner. Our minds and hearts somewhere else. Well, yeah, that's true, but it's not what Paul was talking about. The unworthy manner that the Corinthians were taking the supper was me and my little group. And I won't break bread and remember the death of Jesus with that other group over there. It was a divided church, even if they were kind of meeting at the same place. And kind of at the same time, things were awful in Corinth. And this internal division was the worst. Ah, we probably ought not say worst sin of all. We don't rape and rape sins. But from just looking at the situation, that's the one that staggers us. When brothers and sisters just are pulling apart rather than pulling together. Well, that was Corinth. They could accept a brother entangled in a scandalous relationship. And no big deal. And then they found it much harder to embrace their brethren with whom they disagreed on other matters. Things had just gotten out of whack. And that's what Chloe told Paul. You've got to come. You've got to help. You've got to give us some instruction. Because things are awful here. And so... That first letter, chapters 1 through 4, division in the congregation. Chapter 6, not hesitating to go to courts against one another. Chapters 8 and 10, those with a weak conscience. Forbear with them, no siree, not in Corinth. Chapter 11. Head coverings, not eating the Lord's Supper with others. Chapters 12, 13, and 14, the jealousy and contention over who had which spiritual gift. At its core, it was this party divisive spirit. So that was the first bell. And here's the last slide. Does any of this sound like the world that we live in. 
And here let me rest my throat. And y'all give us an exposition on this. If some of you I see nodding your head. Well, how does it sound like us today? Our world. And I don't mean so much here in this auditorium. Uh, but just the things that are pulling us apart. What similarities do you see, Dave? Well, it's obvious that you're talking about political parties in our country today. It's not our country. It's not obvious I'm talking about political parties. <laughs> no, sir, rebond. Uh, I am a conservative. I ain't a Republican. You can be one without the other. I know brethren that are more left-leaning on some social issues than I am, but they don't identify with a particular part, a Democrat. And in, in my class, we're just not going to go there and approach it from that angle, but I agree with you, approach it from a different angle. There are issues that we have a knee-jerk, immediate reaction to. And because I don't agree with that, I don't agree with just anything about you. That was in Carl. Do you see anything like that in the world we live today? Yeah. You know, if you look at planet Earth, you have countries versus countries, us and them. You have peoples against people. You have major religions against major religion. So kind of working down to the more specific. We have denominations that disagree with what the churches of Christ preach. But I, I think the beauty of the church is, as Christ designed it is the local congregation. Yeah. Because if we were part of a national organization of the churches of Christ and we had a headquarters somewhere, we would get into an us versus them on their stands and their approach to organizing our denomination. So the local congregation is, that's where the unity is so vital because this is our family yeah. that, that will someday, uh, we hope, uh, live together in, in, in heaven. Yeah, let me put in a plug for my friend Derry Barry's Wednesday night class on Genesis and I was out sick last Wednesday night. Did you get into chapter 12, 13, 14, or whatever? Yeah. Uh, back up, though, that Tower of Babel. Uh, what's the most spectacular miracle God ever did? Well, what a silly question. But you know, when God went down and confounded the people and drove them apart, well, that was the easiest miracle he ever did because we're by nature kind of pulling apart and suspicious of one another to begin with it's harder for us to stay together in unity and harmony and it's a lot easier for us to be like ancient Israel every man to his tent every man did that which was right in his own eyes that was not a compliment. That was a criticism. God wants us to be together in our faith and in our work and in our love and in our devotion. And we live in a time, and maybe it's always been this way, there are so many things, including cultural societal, political, however you want to describe it. And for just a little bit, it infiltrates us. And I think John is right. The local church, that's where the rubber meets the road. I don't have any input. I don't have any input. And how the brethren are worshiping this morning in Ottawa or Nigeria or anywhere else. 
but I can work with you and you can work with me together and we can deal with the issues we have here. Janae. Struggle with kind of rooted ourselves in this direction. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and that we can do it this week. And we were saying, since we've been involved with COVID, we're all a little more apart than we were beforehand. Yeah. We don't have as much interaction. And even though we have telephones and cell phones and texts and all of this other activity, we don't do that. Yeah. So we've drifted apart. So we can see that right here in our own local congregation. And we're not the only congregation that's having those issues Exactly, yes. Yeah. Do any of you uh, get the Christian Chronicle? Uh, we get a copy here in the church office. I get a copy. Uh, ever since COVID, every single issue, it's something about what local churches are doing to maintain communication and there are still so many brethren meeting the YouTube and the Zoom and the Facebook Live and not in the same room any longer. Well, how do we maintain our unity in Jesus in the face of COVID? It's a real problem. And one that I know our shepherds have wrestled with. And that was bell number two, wasn't it? Kevin, Lord willing, We'll be back next Sunday and we'll finish up the book of Romans.